You're listening to Voices of Customer Experience. I'm your host, Mary Drummond, and on this podcast, we shine the spotlight on individuals who are making a difference in customer experience. We also proudly bring you the very best of customer experience, behavior economics, data analytics, and design. Make sure to subscribe or follow us on social for updates. Voices of Customer Experience is brought to you by Worthix. Discover your worth at worthix.com. On today's show, I speak to Dominic Venturo, Executive Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer for U.S. Bank. Dominic leads a team of visionaries who see potential in emerging technology or business models and adapt those to fit customer needs as they understand them today or how they envision them in the future. Mr. Venturo is frequently featured as a keynote speaker at industry conferences and has been recognized as Notive Innovator on several occasions. He has 26 years of experience in product development and management, commercial risk management, commercial lendings, and sales management. He's been with U.S. Bank for 16 years. Calling in from the Twin Cities, Minnesota, here's Dominic Venturo. Hi, Mary. Thanks for for chatting today. Thanks for being on. Um, I wanted to start this off for our listeners who don't know about you and the amazing work that you've done so far. Can you just give us a rundown? Tell us a bit about your background. Sure. So um, I've actually been a career banker for uh, for a long time. So ever since college. So I won't bore you with all of that. But I mm-hmm. think more recently, uh, for the last ten years, I've had the opportunity to lead the innovation team here at U.S. Bank, and um, we started out as a relatively small experiment in uh, applied design thinking and uh, iterative prototyping and early product development. So a lot of that was what might look like uh, early research and development in the payment space. We began doing that about 10 years ago, and we spent a fair bit of time early on looking at customer journeys and the way that we understood how customers went about their daily lives. And one of the things that we discovered pretty early on was um, applying ethnographic research and other journey mapping techniques to better understand how uh, our customers, how everyday humans think about their jobs to be done. And it's interesting because what le- what that led to was a really deep understanding of bankers think about products. But this really helped us think more about the customer lens and the jobs to be done and the way that folks think about things. And they think about it in terms of goals, dreams, desires, jobs, business, Mm -hmm. Um, And so that really helps us think very differently about that. So that journey began 10 years ago. We're now a team of uh, about 35 of us. We are focused on uh, emerging markets and technology, sort of uh, longer term product development horizon opportunities, and then working with the business lines to integrate those things into the next generation of product and service roadmaps. Great. Well, you've been heading innovation in an industry that tends to chase innovation as opposed to leading it how has that been and i say this because you know the banking industry is not necessarily the vanguard of innovation most of the time you get new competition popping up you get venmos you get paypals you get cabbage and then the bank industry kind of catches up what sort of challenges do you face being in this industry Yeah, I think when you look at the overall um, banking industry at large, and I'll sort of just stay domestically here in the U.S. because obviously things vary quite a bit globally, but Mm -hmm. in the United States, in the United States, um, the banking industry itself has been, you know, fairly large and diversified in terms of the number of institutions and the products and services and the like. And there's a lot of commonality, right? Um, But then when the digital enablement began, sort of the very late 90s, and we began seeing some opportunity to really develop things differently uh, in terms of the way that customers can experience the way they do business with. I think we saw a lot of really good innovation that came out of the industry. And you look at you look at things like improvements in you know simple things like ATM network operations and the ways that debit cards work globally, and a lot of that uh, really has happened over the last decade or so. Well, your mission, Dominic, is from from what I gather, to improve customer experience through innovation. Is that right? Yeah, it's actually one of the primary things that we try to do. So the way we say it is we look for interesting problems to solve, uh, mm-hmm. to make it easier for our customers to do business with us. Um, and that can mean a lot of different things, right? So it can be the, the mode in which a customer is able to interact with us. Uh, it can be what we do behind the scenes to just thing, make things work more smoothly. Uh, and with and with less friction. 
Okay. Well, what are some of the things in the technology space that you're excited about that you see a, a, an amazing application for banking and that you think will change the way customers interact with banks? Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the things that we're seeing some early promise in is the space of I'll call it sort of what it is technically, natural language processing. But really the basic thing is the ability to speak to uh, your device, right? So that may be how you think about digital assistants or your smart speakers and the like and being able to interact with them. And we're having, uh, we've enabled all three of the major voice platforms here at U.S. Bank um, and, and we're the first to do that. And it was based on some of the early research and development work that we had done in the voice space. Mm -hmm. um, and what we found was that there are some cases where uh, where customers want to be able to just get some very basic information in a real-time way, and this is a, a method of being able to do that. It's pretty limited in terms of your current sets of capabilities, intentionally so, mm -hmm. but um, what we're learning is all those interactions help us understand what kinds of questions do people ask that the system isn't able to do yet. And so mm -hmm. that helps speed product development and feature development. Mm -hmm. um, we're also finding that the environments in which people want to be able to interact with us might be different than we assume. You know, so is it your kitchen or is it your car or is it your office or is it right. all three? And so it, uh, each of those environments have different considerations. So voice is a big deal. The other thing that I would connect to voice um, is what's receiving the voice conversation on the other end. So your smart speakers or those other platforms, digital assistants, in some cases are using uh, some level of artificial intelligence to be able to respond. Um, so obviously you're not, you know, it's not voice to voice. It's not you and I chatting like we are here today. It's you talking to a computer and the computer responding. We saw some amazing technology. stuff from Google on that, right? Recently, we like the, the, had an assistant making a call and stuff. Exactly. So when you look at things like the ability for a computer to be able to understand the context of that conversation and respond appropriately, even with things like behavioral cues or conversational dynamics, inserting an um or a pause, as you referenced in one of the demos that Google did, mm -hmm. it makes that conversation you know, more natural. Sure. Um, but you then can take the same technology and apply it to text. So that mm -hmm. makes chatbots easier to understand and interact right, with. Right, right. Uh, yeah. if, you, if you've used early, uh, if you've used any early sort of chat technology that's automated, it was pretty clunky um, not long ago, like less than two years ago. What's happening in voice is making the written word dialogue, the typed word, the chat word, uh, processes uh, even better. And so those are advancing in similar parallel paths and learning from each other, which is pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, one thing that I've noticed, like, for example, I know that the, that the space, um, both channels, uh, chat and voice are improving. And that's, that's interesting for me, for instance, because I don't like the voice thing. Maybe it's my generation. I'm not sure. Like, I don't even talk on the phone that much anymore. Right. I, I prefer text over speaking any day. So for me, it's all about text. Is that something that you see like generation wise as well in, in banking where newer, younger generations prefer text and older ones prefer voice or in general, is voice more popular? Uh, it's contextual. So let me give you a couple of examples. If all you really wanted to do is get a simple answer to something or a logistics coordination, text is more efficient. Mm -hmm. And the technology has enabled us to sort of, you know, quickly go to solve those kinds of use cases with text. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is, I, I'm, you know, all I'm really looking for is an answer or a direction or a commitment or a confirmation or an address or something. Text works great. When I want to be able to understand and empathize, uh, then you find uh, folks, you know, uh, good old fashioned speaking, uh, either person to person or over the phone uh, works. Um, and so it's contextual, but when you can free up a whole bunch of time by efficiently, you know, texting and IMing uh, instead of long emails that tend to be more formal or long phone conversations that include a lot of maybe unnecessary pleasantries, if all you really need is an answer to a simple question, sure. um, there's an opportunity then to spend more time on the things that matter. Right. And so that's really sort of, really sort of a trick. I used to think that it was a millennial versus a non-millennial generation sort of trend, but what 
Right. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. But the problem that I have as well is that when I do need to get on the phone and I need to speak to someone, I want it to be a person. Like I want it to have I want to speak to someone who's going to have the autonomy to make decisions for me and maybe intercede on my behalf, especially when I see myself calling a bank, for instance. I don't know exactly how I'd feel. Um, you know, one thing is definitely sure when I end up in some call system where I have to speak to a machine, that makes me more frustrated. And as a consumer, that tends to worsen my customer experience, right? So if I, if I do have to make a phone call and call in, it's because something really serious is going on and I need help pronto, right? And then getting stuck in, into kind of that machine speaking to me, it just makes me more annoyed because I can't get across what I want to say. And at some point I'll find myself just yelling into the phone, speak to a representative or something like that, right? Because I, I can't take it. In, in that sense, do you think that part of your, your innovation is to improve that process or will it still be talking in, in a sense to a machine that has a, a natural language processing module going on or is it, will it be speaking to a person more efficiently? You know, so you hit right on the head, which is it's all about being able to do that handoff at the right time mm -hmm. in a contextual way. So, you know, when we receive millions of calls every month from customers who only want to know the balance in their account, Mm -hmm. um, that's the number one reason why people call, or at least, uh, you know, it has consistently been one of the number one reasons why people call that information is available digitally. It's available in the mobile app. It's, you know, online, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are folks who, who want to call and get the information. And what's interesting is they don't really want to call and talk to a human to get the information. They just want right. to call and get the info. So then the trick is being able to understand the context. So is Mary calling to get the balance? What if I just gave that to you right away? If that was your preferred mode of context, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if Mary never calls and suddenly she does, then maybe we should assume that something happened that's complex and we want to be able to route you directly uh -huh. to a live rep. And that's kind of the intelligence that, that, you know, is being built out in these kinds of environments to be able to understand were you just on the web looking at a bunch of different transactions and now you've made a phone call? Well, you probably have a question about those transactions. Sure. And so it's not even, it's not even necessarily just send you to a live rep, but it may also be send you to a live rep who might, you know, be more in tune with either fraud or operational research because of what you were doing online mm -hmm. or in the mobile app before you called. If you want to understand more about the science behind customer decisions, follow our blog at blog.worthix.com or find Worthix on your favorite social media. Getting your CX project off the ground? Start with the right foot by downloading our CX guides, ebooks, and playbooks on worthix.com today. Moving in, I mean, we were talking about millennials, it's kind of unavoidable, the subject does come up. I was reading an article from 2013, which is like a super long time ago in today's day and age. It was done by Viacom and they had established back then two things. Number one, millennials hate banks. And number two, they'd rather do banking operations with anyone else other than the top 10 banks in the US. And when I say anyone else, I mean, they prefer to do it with Apple or Amazon or Square or PayPal or or anyone else in the sphere. Um, again, I'm talking about five years ago. Has this changed? Yeah, it, it's definitely changed. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that we have found over time is that, um, you know, some of our early thinking about how things would evolve has, has changed as well, right? So part of the reason why the initial perception was, you know, I'd rather do business with one of these other companies is, not, it's less about being a bank and not a bank. At least this is what you know we found in the discussions and the research we've done. And let, so let me just give you an example of what I mean. When that research was done, let's say what five years ago, mm -hmm. um, the context would have been that many of those technology companies had very seamless products and solutions that did a certain thing extraordinarily well from a user perspective. They also were meeting customers where they were and enabling them to do business with them in the environment in which was important to them. Mm -hmm. So was that, a, you know, visually interesting and photo centric? And so was it a, you know, a photo, a photo app, for example, 
um, or, you know, wasn't in an environment in which they could, you know, collaborate with their friends and communicate around what they're going to do next and things like that. And so a lot of those tools really took off and became the expectation setter. Oh, it works great. I can control access. I can affect the communication ways that I want to be able to do it. If I want to, you know, send pictures or videos or do whatever, all of those things were enabled. And in most cases, within that time frame, you would have looked at the solutions that banks had available and said, wow, not up to snuff in terms of that expectation level. Sure. So, you know, the banks have advanced pretty dramatically uh, along that timeline. And the, oh, banking is different. And, uh, you know, things like the ever-present data breach and a number of other things have happened within that sort of five-year time window that have caused expectations to say, ooh, well, maybe as long as the products and services work similarly and meet me where I need them to meet me and are not enabled, and if they're going to protect my information in a way that is different, right, mm -hmm. um, then, then, may, then maybe it does make sense to sort of have these things compartmentalized. And we're seeing really good growth in that market segment overall. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think it is a matter of, to your point, making sure that you're out in front of the change um, and there has been a bit of that, uh, uh, you know, accordion effect in the, the industry where it's, you know, catch up, uh, catch up, see some things advance, catch up again. Uh, but I think that's uh, narrowing pretty dramatically, at least from my perspective. Why is it that I naturally prefer to use Venmo or Cash App as opposed to Zelle, which offers maybe the exact same service? Is it because there's a social proof element? In, in Venmo where my friends are on there and it's got that cool kind of gamification thing going on and, and Zelle is, is a bit more squared and a bit more, uh, you know, structured in a serious way. Where, where is the, the connection in that? Why, why is it that people are still preferring, if all of the banks are connected through Zelle or at least the biggest players, why are people still preferring Venmo and Cash App and these other alternatives? Well, you know, Mary, when we look at the space, I think, you know, there's a couple of things to consider. One, uh, Zelle is pretty new. Um, the volume and the growth within the Zelle network, which you, know, you could go out and take a look at, uh, and any of the listeners could go out and take a look at the information that's been published, has been pretty incredible. So from something that didn't exist to something that is, uh, you know, on par sort of from a market competitive perspective in the volume, if not ahead of some of what were traditionally the leaders tells us that there's a a problem being solved and that there are use cases that, uh, that apply. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of what we're seeing is, you know, real time availability to funds is a differentiator. So that, um, so that real time, both movement and access uh, matters. Uh, and then the simple integration into the bank app. Now, um, what do we have to overcome from a, from a product and a network perspective? We have to overcome sort of that incumbency you're already there. Your friends are already using another app. They're mm -hmm. already used to using how it works. It may have some tools that they like about it. You know, being able to, you know, share social context is something that uh, we've certainly seen folks say that they that they like or appreciate about some of the other solutions, right? So there's mm -hmm. a there there are differentiators there. I think as you see the products evolve, you know, you'll see different features getting incorporated over time. But right now, the traction has been really strong, uh, and and it's sort of gone from uh, you know zero to major competitor in a pretty short period of time. Sure. So we're optimistic about that. Mm -hmm. Well, then the other thing, just kind of adding on to that, is one way or another, Zelle was kind of developed as an answer to a pain of the market, right? Which was that possibility to transfer money in a heartbeat. How is it that you, in your department, you listen to the speed of change and you listen to the changes in the value proposition that clients or the expectations that clients are looking for? So what sort of channels are you using to be able to, to listen to the voice of your customer? Yeah, that's a, uh, that, that is an awesome question and a very complex sort of answer, but I'll give you a few examples. I mean, clearly we have, you know, our own customer experience group and we have a lot of voice of the customer work that comes out of there that is super useful and valuable and it helps us uh, see directionally how things are being, you know, perceived. But then you might see some non-traditional things, you know, so we look at what's happening in the social media space and what folks are saying and we look for keywords and what kinds of things folks are commenting on about uh, products or services of ours or our competitors or of, you know, fintechs or other services. That gives us sort of a bit of a listening edge to understand, you know, 
not only at what are people saying, but what is their attitude about what are they're saying, right? What's the context and what's their perception? You know, there's always perception and reality. And we may think ABC product is the best thing that's been ever designed. But, you know, if the feedback and the chatter about it isn't, the best, then the perception is it isn't. And so we have to listen to that and incorporate it. One of the other tools that we use is working with the call centers and looking at the feedback that they're getting um, around both uh, either complaint trends or issue trends. And I'll give you a, a simple example uh, that ended up being a pretty neat solution. Mm-hmm. So when individuals travel, it's not uncommon when you travel and go on vacation uh, that you might run into an issue with your card working because you're out yeah. traveling and doing things in a different environment, then you might look like a fraudster to the yeah. fraud engines. And so, you know, we heard from the fraud group, hey, when we accident, you know, accidentally decline is my word, they would say, you know, technically it's a false positive. But when we decline a legitimate transaction, customers get pretty upset about that. Yeah. They're on vacation, they're trying to enjoy themselves, their card doesn't work, it's stressful. I might have to call internationally to get it fixed and, and on. And so one of the things that we did is we collaborated internally with our technology partners to enable our mobile app with customer permission to keep track of the device's location. So when you get off the plane and the device connects to the cell tower, we're able to say, oh, Mary's landed in London. Mm-hmm. And that way we can affect the way we look at the uh, the risk scoring of those transactions and improve the authorization experience. And the results have actually been very positive. So, you know, that's an example of listening right yes. through the, you know, the complaint or the frustration side and then, you know, developing a solution uh, through that. And how is it that you guys are able to tell, like, I'm pretty sure, you know, one thing that we see here at Worthix, which is the company I work at, is lots of times the highest volume of complaint isn't necessarily the complaint that's actually going to lead the client to churn. Sure. So when you look at that kind of research, I mean, there's the anecdotal side, right, qualitative, and then there's the quantitative. Mm -hmm. So part of what you want to do is look at actual behavior over time, so longitudinally, um, where you can look at events and then you can say, well, are those events predictive or not predictive of somebody, for instance, leaving the bank or closing an account or changing their behavior? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's sort of one more scientific approach. The less scientific and, and maybe more powerful is being able to get at the emotional state of angst, if you will, mm-hmm. um, of what happens. And so part of that, you can get out of the voice analytics and get out of the call center information and the logs that happen because you can see it with the context uh, of that conversation and really understand better sort of, is it a minor irritant? Like, oh, that's, you know, oh, I understand. uh, And now I have the information and so I'll move on. Or is it genuinely a business changing sort of thing? So um, there's there's some value in being able to get at that data. Because, I mean, you guys, well, U.S. Bank is the sixth largest bank in the country. You guys have a lot of customers, I'd imagine. How can you, how do you even sample that? <laughs> well, you know, so a lot of that information is, comes out of the, you know, comes out of the call logs and the analysis, right? Mm-hmm. So we have to be able to study all, study all of that data, which then leads into what I would call the, you know, the data analytics of side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and our, our bank, you know, I'm very proud of the capabilities that our bank has. I'm sure, uh, you know, the other major banks have similar capabilities, but there are very sophisticated data analytics shops that mm-hmm. help the product and business owners understand those kinds of contexts. Worthix is disrupting the market research industry with cutting edge technology and a revolutionary methodology. Visit worthix.com to learn how we're using artificial intelligence to improve customer experience at companies like Verizon, Jeep, Blizzard, HP, and L'Oreal. This has been a really great conversation, Dominic. I think it falls right in line with what we try to address here, which is the data analytics, which is the behavior analytics. It's Um, the entire CX sphere and how that's affecting the market and how that's causing disruption. But I did want to end this conversation with a question that I like asking the podcast guests, which is how do you see the future of CX for banks? Where do you see this going? What do you think are are the trends? What's coming next? I think that 
I think the big next field is um, anticipating what it is we want to do next, very much the way we serve our customers today. And this isn't a negative comment. It's just the state of, you know, sort of current reality and capability, but it's very much reactionary. So if you want to know something, we have an answer. If you want to see your balance, you ask for it, we show it to you, or you click on it and it shows up or, right? Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, w- what about that future when we have the ability to anticipate because we know you from your data and behavior and the way that you interact with us that, you know, on Wednesday mornings, you like to know your balance and what bills are due. So mm-hmm. maybe we make that available to you. But if we sent it to you every single day, it would be like those offers you get in email. Right. At first, it sounded like a good idea. And then all of a sudden, they email you every day. And pretty soon you do what? You opt out. You stop doing Absolutely. business with the brand. Mm-hmm. So it's got to be contextual and it has to be anticipatory. And I think that paradigm shift will happen uh, o- over the not too distant future based on what we see. And I think that'll be pretty cool. It'll it'll really make things be helpful as opposed to responsive. And let me ask you something that takes us into a different area, which is slightly delicate because then you start talking about data right? And you start privacy to be able to foresee perhaps uh, and anticipate customers moves. You have to have access to a lot of their personal information. What, what's the line? Like when does it start getting creepy and, and when is it actually to, to, you know, to customers benefit? I mean, like, you know, I, in the podcast that we did with Joe Pine, he said, you know, customers normally welcome you having access to their data as long as it's being used to help them and as long as it's not making them a target for remarketing ads, et cetera, et cetera. So where do you think we should draw that line? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good, that's a good framework. I mean, first of all, you, you really have to approach things from an opt-in privacy by design perspective, right? So enable individuals to have control over their data. But then with the right transparency and the right explanation of what we want to do and why, I think there's a pretty compelling case. You know, I used the location example for helping with authorizations and fraud. Um, And we've had millions of customers opt into that, right? Mm -hmm. So purposefully chose to participate for the benefit of having better cardholder experience. Right. Um, And so, you know, now that's not the same as going out and grabbing a whole bunch of, you know, unrelated data from other sources and repatriating it. So then you'd have to sort of be very crystal clear around where those walls are. But I think it really starts with looking at the customer from a customer central perspective and saying, what would they expect? What have they agreed to? And then within those sets of boundaries, what kinds of things are realistic and expected for you to be able to do? Mm -hmm. Because if I look at all of your purchase behavior, there are some things I could infer about that purchase behavior that might not be the thing the bank should do with that. Right. right. You, you mentioned re- retargeting or marketing, right? Mm-hmm. So exporting that data and then marketing some other product, probably not appropriate. Saying, hey, it looks like you've been repairing your car a lot, maybe a car loan, or maybe we can help you get into a new car. Maybe that is appropriate. Mm-hmm. So I think it'll be I think it'll be within the context and within the permissions that have been granted and the level of trust that's provided. Do you think that the newer generations are more open to this where they're like, oh, it isn't creepy at all that my bank is now offering me car loans because I've been going to the mechanic all the time. (laughs) I think that it varies by personality type. Okay. So um, I think it's more around, are you a very hyper privacy centric person or are you not? Um, And there are folks who fall into either of those camps across uh, generations generally. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think that it's, it can be episodic, depends on what happens elsewhere around the world and becomes public and headlines and all of a sudden people change their perceptions. Mm-hmm. So it has the ability to be influenced by events that, that obviously play into how you think about things. Right. Well, most of the people I know, when that whole Cambridge Analytica scandal broke, they were like, well, obviously you chose to give your data to those people and they weren't shocked at all. Whereas other people from maybe generations that came before mine were totally shocked and appalled at the fact that this information was being used that way. But in truth, I think that we all should have been rather appalled and, but it's become a norm where we kind of feel like, Oh, we put our information out there. So I don't really care what happens to it. And maybe these concerns will come to, to bite us later on in life. Right. When, when we have problems with identity fraud and 
uh, or identity theft and, and, you know, our social security numbers being used all over the globe. Do you think it's a matter of experience as well, where some people don't well, mind their data being out there because they don't know what can happen? Yeah, I mean, I've seen some research. We didn't do it, but I've read some research where, um, you know, whether or not you have been a victim of one of those kinds of bad events, right? So if your data has been compromised or your account was taken over or other kinds of things, your perspective is obviously very different. Mm -hmm. If your only perception is based on nothing bad has ever happened to you, you might have an unrealistically uh, positive view about, sure. you know, sort of the likelihood of something happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so our experience tends to frame our expectations. Yeah. And then you do get into personality differences, which I mentioned before, which are just mm -hmm. part of understanding different human psychology. But the um, but generally speaking, um, because we live in a largely, we in the U.S., I'll use specifically, mm -hmm. um, we live in a largely freemium economy where a lot of the digital platforms we enjoy are free and there's a reason that they're free and they might have a premium level or they might be ad-based or they might be otherwise. I think folks that understand that natively, quote, get it. Uh, and those that don't, the fact that they don't get it doesn't mean they shouldn't be educated. So that's a job on us to help them understand better where their data are and how it could be exposed or at risk. Well, I got to say that this conversation has give me, given me a, a newly found respect of the bank industry that maybe perhaps I was a bit rash with. So I appreciate it, Dominic. Um, if, if people want to keep hearing what you have to say and uh, follow your views, where can they find you? Well, a couple of things. So uh, on usbank.com, uh, we have a thing called Newsroom. So there are uh, periodic articles and, and thought pieces that we publish out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I occasionally put things out on LinkedIn or Medium uh, as well, uh, personally. But from a, from a company position perspective, you'll, you'll find things under usbank.com in our newsroom. Perfect. Well, I follow you on Twitter. Is that a good channel as well? Uh, Twitter's good if you want to see sort of the eclectic, uh, uh, <laughs> because it's mostly around sort of the the trends and observations and the occasional rant that I find, uh, mm -hmm. some of which have to do with banking and payments and innovation, many of which do not. But uh, certainly welcome to follow me there as well. I'm innovator, uh, which, you know, proud to say 10 years, 10 years ago or so, I was able to snag that, snag that one. <laughs> awesome. Okay, thank you so much, Dominic. Be sure to, to follow Dominic if you want to keep hearing what he has to say and stay tuned for more episodes on Voices of Customer Experience. Thank you for listening to Voices of Customer Experience. If you'd like to hear more or get a full podcast summary, visit the episode details page or go to blog.worthix.com slash podcasts. This episode of Voices of Customer Experience was hosted and produced by Mary Drummond, co-hosted by James Conrad and edited by Nick Gomez. Blog copy and summary by Emma Waldron. 